Wheeland Presley Funeral Home and Crematory have been serving Quad City families and veterans since 1889. Wheeland Presley Funeral Homes are located in Rock Island, Milan, and Reynolds, and are proud supporters of WQPT. Alternatives is a proud supporter of WQPT and has been serving our community for 40 years. Alternatives provides professional guidance to maintain independence and quality of life for older adults and adults with disabilities. Iowa's abortion laws are about to change, and we join a group that's ready to celebrate the American trucker in the cities. Roe v. Wade is the 1973 federal ruling that changed the way abortions were treated across the country, making them legal in all 50 states rather than regulated differently state to state. But you may not know of two other cases at the state level in Iowa that also now impacts abortion. One decision ruled against the fetal heartbeat bill that bans abortions once a heartbeat is detected. Often that's a month and a half into a pregnancy. The other was a 24-hour waiting period restriction for women seeking an abortion. Now, Governor Kim Reynolds wants the state Supreme Court to weigh in on those decisions once again. And she's welcoming another new legislation from Republicans who control the state House and Senate. With Republicans dominating both of the chambers, there may be little that Democrats can do at this point. Or is there? We talked with Davenport Democratic State Representative Phyllis Thede. Let me start with your initial reaction of the U.S. Supreme Court decision as well as the Iowa Supreme Court decisions in regards to abortion. Did this at all surprise you? No, absolutely not. We saw it coming. And, you know, over the years, they have pushed this agenda for quite some time. So it's not surprising that it happened. I think where you have Republican um, governors, this is something they have been pushing for quite some time. I think the thing that's disappointing is that to see that the Supreme Court is now political as opposed to being the last best effort, you know, for citizens of the United States. So as far as um, this, a surprise, no, absolutely not. Those who are against abortion would say this is high time. This is the way America is and, and America is speaking out right now. Mm -hmm. You know, we need to go back and look at something that happened just a couple of years ago. And I'm sure you'll remember this. Um, when COVID hit, um, many people did not want to take the vaccinations or wear the mask. And their chant, which they borrowed from a lot of us, was that my choice, my body. They use that all the time. And I find it interesting that now that um, th this has happened, that's not, they're not saying that anymore. And, but they use that phrase quite a bit during that time of COVID. And so it's really kind of disingenuous to sit there and say that abortion rights should be taken away from women. It should be a choice for women. That's what we want for women. Nothing else but a choice. And to do this, this is based on some religious um, idea and this is not something that we need to do. One would argue though that the unborn have rights as well. I mean, where, where, are, where are the rights in that situation? Right, right. Let me give you a scenario that I read the other day and, um, and this might shed some light on this. I was reading that if you have an unborn child or is born stillborn, they don't recognize that, that that child, you can't do a deduction, you can't do anything. So it already is in there that that child is not recognized because that child was stillborn or who had died. So I find that interesting that um, that's in, that is in there now. And so now whether the states or the Supreme Court decide to change that, we'll see what happens. What have you heard from your constituents so far? Have your constituents spoken out to you? 
Yes. Oh, yes, 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 yes. They're very frustrated. They're very angry. Um, I attended a rally about a week ago, and we had, it was at Vanderveer. We had so many people there. And they want the right to choose. That's what they want. They want to be able to make choices for themselves and for their families. If they can't do that, that really sends a bad message. And this affects every political persuasion. It's not just not Democrat, it's Republican, it's independents, it's all people. And so, yes, I've heard from many people that are saying they're frustrated, they're angry, and this decision that's being taken away from them leaves them in a lurch. And so, yes, people are very, very upset. You are, of course, a Democrat in what's becoming a more Republican state, certainly in the State House and the Senate, a Republican dominated. One would ask, what can you do? We can continue the fight. You know, we've been at this juncture before. Um, where we have tried to do rights for citizens, whether it be African American, the gay community, and others. We fight and we fight and we fight until things change. And we cannot do anything else. We cannot rest with this decision. It's a bump in the road right now. And it may take some time to get this um, reversed. But here's the thing that we've got to do. We need the citizens of Iowa to get out there and spread their voices about this issue. If they're not happy with it, then say something. Work with people that will help make the changes. And changes will not happen until we get people out there to vote that will vote for things that are like-minded. And we have to get that done. Well, one would, argument, uh, one would argue that is that Democrats would always be able to fight against what they cons considered a conservative uh, out of step views by taking it to the courts. The courts were always kind of the last salvation in many ways. Now it seems that that's not the case, at least for progressive Democrats. Mm -hmm. You're right. Right now, um, if we look at how the courts are made up, mostly Republican, um, that is going to be a challenge. Absolutely. But I think what's going to happen in, in, in coming days is that we're going to see um, situations with women whether it be a topical pregnancy or a possible miscarriage or stillborn or any of that, there will be court challenges um, along the way to say, wait a minute, we have situations here that needs to be addressed. And to just blanketly say no abortions of any kind is not very responsible. So I believe that those court challenges will come up over a period of time, and that will have us go back to what we need to do. We have taken so much focus on the legislature or Congress or the U.S. Supreme Court, and perhaps we haven't given enough attention to the Iowa State Supreme Court, uh, which also had held off on the fetal heartbeat bill, uh, which basically would not have allowed abortions after six weeks of a pregnancy or the 24 hour waiting period, both passed in the Republican legislature and supported by the Republican governor. As you know, Governor Reynolds calling for the courts to readdress that. It seems like the makeup of the state Supreme Court has changed and will continue to change, of course, with another retirement. Um, I, what, what do you see coming out of the state Supreme Court, which is something that I think a lot of Iowans don't really recognize or, or take much uh, attention toward? And, you know, I think what's probably going to happen, and I'm just surmising this, I don't know for sure, um, that the courts will kick it back to the state legislature. And the reason why I say that is because actually um, we were working towards that, if you remember, um, last year, and now this is the last year that it can, it'll go through our legislative process. And in 2024, um, actually, it can be put on a vote for, for the citizens of Iowa. So we were heading in that direction anyway. And so I think what will happen is that the courts will recognize that it now has to go back to the legislature. Um, and we will see if that's the actual case. Um, I, I, I think they want, I think the courts would like to see it work through the legislative process. And um, we'll see if that really does happen. Is it almost guaranteed that you expect to see some referendum for a constitutional amendment in Iowa for uh, um, either a right for an abortion or the opposite to make it outlawed? 
It could be, you know, I hate, I hate to say yes or no to either one, but I think I'm going to have to just take a wait and see attitude. I'm not quite sure how we're going to deal with this. Um, I think the most scariest thing is that, you know, Iowa has been such a welcoming state. And now that this is happening, like other states, Iowa's not going to be the only one, obviously. You know, we have a sign that says, welcome to Iowa. But we can't do that anymore. I mean, we're taking so many rights away. Look what's happened with education. Uh, to me, it's just like, hey, if you come here, do what we want, and you'll be just fine. And so that's a terrible message to send to people. And if you remember also, there are certain things that you can't say. If you're teaching a diversity class, you can't call somebody a racist, you know, in, in the educational sense. And so we are losing our rights as um, the Iowa Republican legislature are making decisions they think is best for everyone. And this is not the way to handle everything. Our job is not to do nasty legislation. Our job is to represent the state, do the best for people who need a job, who need good, a great education, and who need health care. That's our job, simple. Oh, and do the budget. If we stick with those things, actually, those are very conservative things that I'm talking about. But over, over the past few years, Republicans have just gone a different way. They have gone to the most radical things that you can go to. And um, their course has changed. And that's very uh, disarming. But they're also winning. Representative Thede, I mean, uh, the Republicans yes. are, are leading in the House and the Senate. Their majorities ha have hardly changed in the last few elections. So isn't that the will of the people then? It could be. But I tell you what, just like what's happened with Roe versus Wade, we will see more people coming out. And if enough people come out, we will see change. And I think before, unfortunately, I think it wasn't people got complacent. They weren't, it wasn't so bad for them. And so now you have a huge issue like this one. And now they're, they're realizing that their choices will be taken away. Now, if you also remember, um, they've talked about look, re look at gay marriage and, um, you know, contraceptives. So if those things get re-looked at and taken away, uh, how much more are citizens willing to give up their rights? That's something I don't get. How much more are you willing to take? How much more are you willing to give away? In the name of what? And so, yes, you are correct when you say that right now they own everything. But you know what? There's always a shift. There was a shift back in the 70s. They have the win right now, but I believe that there will be a shift. And I'm hoping out for hope for that one. Well, as you know, elections so often run uh, parallel with the economy. Democrats expect not to do very well because the economy is in, in a tough strait. Things could change by November, of course. But do you see that abortion is the big rallying point for progressives and Democrats for the upcoming election? Yeah, I think for a lot of people, yes, it is. It is. I think the fear is that I'm losing something. And so if I'm losing something, I'm more than likely going to get out and I'm going to vote to make a difference. I think that's what people have to do. It's as simple as that. You must get out. You must vote. You must work to help the people that are running to make sure that your voices are heard. Right now, it's not fair that some Iowans are, are getting what they want and some Iowans are not. That's not what we're supposed to be about. We're supposed to be making sure that all Iowans have a piece of the pie. Right now, that pie is not sliced very evenly. And so the only way to make this happen is for people, I'm just gonna encourage people, please, please get out there, work hard, vote hard. Vote as if this is the last best effort. Because if you don't, more changes will come, more things will hurt you, and more things will be taken away from you. So if you're not in this for the long haul, then I'm sorry, but you need to make sure that you're doing what's best. And so hopefully we'll see in November a large number of people out there voting.
You live in an interesting area, all of eastern Iowa uh, along the uh, Illinois border, where uh, you're seeing more restrictions being added on abortion in Iowa. And in Illinois, uh, the governor and the Democratic majorities in the House and the Senate looking to uh, protect abortion rights. What do you think that's going to happen to the Quad City area where one side of the river has one set of laws, another side of the river has another? Yeah, it, this is not a good thing. It really is not. It's like, I don't understand how one governor is so extreme, uh, Governor Reynolds, and then you have a man who respects, and I find it interesting, you have a man who respects a woman's right to choose and a woman in Iowa who doesn't respect that. And I find that rather interesting. It's just like reversed. And so how's it going to hurt us? It makes us look like we don't care about women. And we have a man over a governor, a man over in Illinois who cares about women. I think that sends a terrible, terrible message. How do you do that? And so this is going to make us look bad. And I'm concerned that over time that for Iowa, I don't, I, I'm concerned that is if we don't try to do something better, it's just not going to look good for us. Now, look, I'm going to do something terrible, but we have an opportunity to elect a great governor and Deirdre DuJour. And people need to look at her and say, look, she's going to help us get back to what we need to do, not just for abortion, but for all things like education. We need to look at her because I believe that she will do the right thing. Um, and like I said before, we've got a, a female governor who doesn't support women, and we've got a male governor who supports women. So sports women's rights, let me just put it that way. And so I think we gotta take a look at that. State Representative Phyllis Thede, Democrat from Davenport. The heart of summer is upon us right now. So it's a perfect time to either get outside for some great events or find some cool indoor activities for you and your family. Laura Adams has some great ideas as she goes out and about. This is Out and About for July 8th through 14th. It's time for the Mercer County Fair in Alito from the 12th through 16th, and the Walcott Truckers Jamboree returns with family fun the 14th and 15th. Plus, the 37th annual Moonlight Chase in Eldridge takes place the 9th at 7.30. The Israeli film series at the Figgy Art Museum present Crescendo, where conductor Edward Spork accepts the job to create an Israeli-Palestinian youth orchestra, running July 10th at 4. The Nitty Gritty Dirt Band performs at the Rhythm City City Casino the 14th at 8. Music on the Lawn features music for new people at the Dear Wyman House on the 13th at 5. Bass Street Landing Summer Concert Series features Wicked Liz and the Belly Swirls the 14th at 7. RMEs Live at 5 host Pisos Cure on the 8th and Soul Storm on the 15th at 7. The Galva Music Series present Jackie Venson and Invisible Cartoons at Wiley Park the 10th at 6. And the Song Bag Concert Series features Angela Meyer at the Car Carl Sandburg State Historic Site in Galesburg on the 10th at 2. Billy Currington performs at the Rust Belt the 9th, followed by L.A. Guns and Faster Pussycat on the 10th. Join Genesius Guild for the Greek tragedy Sophocles Electra the 9th and 10th at Lincoln Park, and Quad City Music Guild presents Cinderella at the Prospect Park Theater the 8th through the 16th. For more information, visit WQPT.org. Thank you, Laura. Interstate 80 is the lifeline of American commerce, the super highway that handles thousands of trucks each and every day. This month, the Iowa 80 truck stop is holding its annual Truckers Jamboree. It comes as truck drivers face some of the highest gas and diesel prices on record. We talked with Heather DeBailey, who's the vice president of marketing with the Iowa 80 group. The Truckers Jamboree is actually celebrating its 43rd year. That's pretty amazing. And it really started with kind of humble beginnings, didn't it? Oh, my gosh. We were just a little party in the parking lot, a couple hay bales and some music, and called some of the local truck dealers and asked if they had any new trucks they wanted to bring out and put on display. And we're still a party in the parking lot. It's just a lot bigger. Yeah, it's a party that drew, what, 45,000 people last year. This is no small event. Uh, uh, tell me how it's grown. I mean, are you even surprised that it's this big? You know, it, I really am surprised. And I think a lot of that is the fact that people have a good time when they're here. 
and they tell their friends. And there's so many different things for people in trucking, people who aren't in trucking to enjoy. I mean, we have live concerts in the evening, fireworks, super truck beauty contest. I mean, who doesn't love a big Iowa pork chop to eat? You know, antique trucks. We have trucker Olympics and a pet contest. And it's just like a big family reunion. And who doesn't love all those kind of quirky games and things to do? Well, and as you said, I mean, headlining is what? The group Diamond Rio? Diamond Rio is, is our headliner for Friday night, yes. And we have bands, um, two bands playing Thursday, two on Friday, and one on Saturday afternoon. You always kind of somehow, if you're a townie, think that this is a collection of, of truckers that are from the area and maybe some people that are from Muscatine or Cedar or Scott County but you draw from a bunch of different states and even Canada. Yes, last year we had uh, 26 different states represented and as well as three Canadian provinces. So people make the Jamboree uh, their vacation. Uh, it becomes a destination for people and that's what's really exciting. And you know that's kind of how it is a family reunion because a lot of these drivers may only see each other once a year in Walcott to reconnect. It's pretty fun. Well, and let's, let's talk about that because it is a celebration of truckers. And if you think of trucking, it really is kind of a solitary profession where you're on the road all the time. And, and you do get a chance, I'm sure, to make some bonds and some connections, particularly at Iowa 80. It is true. And you know what's great is we've made connections as you know people here at Iowa 80 with these drivers. And we're excited to see them year after year. And we get to know their trucks. and we might see them on the road when we're somewhere. We're like, hey, I know that truck. He comes to the Super Truck Beauty Contest every year. You know, that's Paul or, you know, that's Michael, you know, or that's Eva Nelson. She has a, a pink truck that um, I saw parked over at our headquarters building just a couple weeks ago. So it's, it's pretty cool. It's also a draw, though, of non-truckers. I mean, you want everyone there because you're celebrating truckers, but the trucking industry has an impact on all of us. Absolutely, and I think nothing made that more clear than the pandemic and how important the truck driving profession is. And it's something we've known all along and we've been celebrating for 43 years. And we really hope that other people, you know, in the Quad Cities, outside of the Quad Cities and the surrounding areas, come and have some fun. You wanna know what a truck looks like up close? You wanna get inside some pretty cool rigs? Come out here to Walcott, and that is the place to do it during the Walcott Truckers Jamboree. You talk to truckers day in and day out, and you did bring up the pandemic. Two and a half years where we, we, truckers were proven to be essential workers, which I think some people uh, never even thought about and never considered before. Now you're at a period of time where we have uh, inflation and high gas prices. You talk to these truckers. How tough is it for them right now? You know, for the owner operator, that's it's a big deal. I mean, imagine five or six dollar a gallon diesel and you have 500 gallon tank. You know, do the math on that real quick and you can see the impact, you know, that that has has doubled their operating cost, you know, when it comes to fuel. And, you know, a lot of times they can't pass all of that on. So they have to to really watch and the loads that they're taking you know, that they're getting paid for, they, they may have to pass on some if it's not paying enough to cover, cover their costs. Um, you know, for the fleets, a lot of people, anybody that's in supply chain or ordering goods, you see on your bill of lading, you know, you see on your bills, the fuel surcharge. Well, that's, that's necessary because of, of how expensive everything is right now with diesel. Yeah, and, and you think of all of us that we went through the pandemic and now we have to pay a little more for our gas prices as well. And you think of the emotional toll and the stress that it has for us. It really has been an enormously stressful three years for those who are in the trucking industry, whether it's, it's because of the fear of the pandemic and their health or else the fear of their economic well-being right now because of these high gas prices. I mean, there's a lot of stress out there. You know, it is, and it's, it's getting a lot better. I mean, it was, it was very an interesting time. And as a truck stop, you know, we were open the entire time because we were also essential. I mean, the drivers needed a place to park. They needed a place to eat, to shower, to rest because they were continuing to work. You know, there's no option to be a truck driver from home. There's no option to be a truck stop from home. 
Um, so we, we never closed and we never have closed since we opened the doors in 1964. Um, but, you know, we're proud to be able to do that. We were proud to be able to serve drivers during that time as we continue to serve. And I just want everyone to understand that drivers are, they are hard workers and they are very smart business people. They have to be really good at time management. And there's a lot of paperwork and regulations that they have to deal with on a daily basis. And um, we should all be thankful that they're willing to do that to deliver us what we need. Last year, Iowa 80 uh, started adding uh, some charging stations for uh, electric vehicles. Uh, you know, we're talking about the wave of the future. You got to follow the new technology as well. Uh, what have you seen? I mean, are they being used to a great extent? Are you seeing a, a greater use for these charging stations? And, and is that really going to be like right next to the pumps, that that is the future for uh, the trucking industry as well as for the rest of the drivers in America? I think it's going to be uh, very difficult for the trucking industry, because if you think about how much power that is going to take just to charge one semi, um, I know that the, the power kind of the substation, if you will, that we had to put in just to serve the eight Tesla chargers and the two universal chargers that we have is more, takes more power than the entire rest of the truck stop. That's amazing. Um, so is, is think it, about that for a minute. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. That's incredible. But is it being used? The, we, the Tesla chargers, I see Tesla's charging every day. <laughs> Um, and sporadically, I'll see, you know, the universal chargers being used. But I think the Tesla group, I think they're just more active. And I yeah. think they're um, maybe willing to take that risk to try to drive across country or drive long distances. You know, they, they plan with their, their Tesla network of, of chargers. Um, but they are definitely, the Tesla ones are being used well, every single day. This is your last time. I mean, the Jamboree's coming up. You're inviting everyone to be there. Of course, the weather's going to be great. The entertainment's going to be great. And you get a chance to have some fun and good food and, and, and camaraderie as well. Absolutely. And the best part is it's free admission, free parking, concerts are free, and you can look at the schedule of events online at truckersjamboree.com. We hope to see you there. Our thanks to Heather DeBailey, Vice President of Marketing with the Iowa 80 Group. The Truckers Jamboree is going to be held July 14th through the 16th at the Iowa 80 Truck Stop in Walcott. On the air, on the radio, on the web, on your mobile device, and streaming on your computer. Thanks for taking some time to join us as we talk about the issues on the cities. Wheeland Presley Funeral Home and Crematory have been serving Quad City families and veterans since 1889. Wheeland Presley Funeral Homes are located in Rock Island, Milan, and Reynolds, and are proud supporters of WQPT. Alternatives is a proud supporter of WQPT and has been serving our community for 40 years. Alternatives provides professional guidance to maintain independence and quality of life for older adults and adults with disabilities.